The Speaker hereby appoints the Select Committee to act like committee from the Senate pursuant to House Concurrent Resolution 51. Representative Pike, Bailey, Lavasco, Evans, Kelly, 141, Prouty, Ellibrock, Engel, Rogers, and Berenger. Gentleman from St. Louis County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're going to start this afternoon by uh, voting to suspend House Rule 123. This will allow members of the Senate and the governor to enter our chamber. The gentleman from St. Louis County has moved that House Rule 123 be suspended to receive the Senate and the governor into the chamber. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of uh, suspending House Rule 123 will vote yes. All those opposed vote no. Ms. Clerk, please ring the bell and open the board. Has everyone voted?
Has everyone voted? Mr. Clerk, please close the board and tally the vote. By your vote of 128 yes and three present, you have approved the gentleman's motion. Gentleman from St. Louis County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next order of business will be the State of the State Address. Mr. Sergeant-at-Arms. Mr. Speaker, the members of the Senate now approach the chamber. Mr. Sergeant-at-Arms, open the doors and allow the members of the Senate to enter the chamber.
The joint session of the 101st General Assembly's second regular session will come to order. Mr. Sergeant of Arms. Mr. President, the Missouri State Highway Patrol Troop F Color Guard will now present the colors. Mr. Sergeant of Arms, open the doors and allow Missouri State Highway Patrol Troop F Color Guard to present the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Please help me thank Highway Patrol Troop F Color Guard. The Clerk of the House will open the board. All members of the House will signify their presence by voting aye. Mr. Clerk, please ring the bell and open the board. The Secretary of Senate will call the roll for the members of the Senate. Madam Secretary. Senators Arthur, Bean, Here. Beck, Bernsketter, Bratton, Here. Brown, Here. Burleson, Here. Sarapoy, Crawford, Here. Eigel, Here. Esslinger, Here. Gannon, Here. Hageman, Here. Hoskins, Here. Huff, Here. Koenig, Here. Luke DeMeyer, Here. May, Here. Moon, Mosley, O'Loughlin, Onder, Razor, Here. Riddle, Here. Rizzo, Here. Roberts, Here. Rowden, Schatz, Shoup, Thomas Rader, Washington, Here. White, Here. Whelan, Aye. Williams, Has everyone voted? The clerk of the house will close the board and tally the vote. There are 124 members of the house president and 28 members of the Senate. A quorum has been established. Will the Joint Escort Committee for the Governor please assemble to the rear of the chamber? Representatives Pike, Bailey, Lavasco, Evans, Kelly, 141, Prouty, Ellenbrock, Engel, Rogers, and Brerringer, Senators Schatz, Hegeman, Onder, Riddle, Whelan, Razor, Williams, Shoup, Mosley, and May. As they assemble, I'm happy to introduce our special guest for today. To my left, Secretary of the State, Jay Ashcroft. <laughs> Auditor, Nicole Galloway. <laughs> Treasurer, Scott Fitzpatrick.
Attorney General Eric Schmidt. We are also pleased to have justices from the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Paul Wilson. <laughs> Judge Robin Ransom. <laughs> Judge Patricia Be Breckenridge. <laughs> Judge Brent Powell. and Clerk of the Supreme Court, Betsy Abishan. We're also pleased to have members of the Governor's Cabinet here, uh, Acting Director of Office Administration, Ken Zellers, <laughs> Department of Agriculture Director, Chris Chin, And since I forgot to announce her last year, Department of Agriculture Director Chris Chin. <laughs> Department of Commerce and Insurance Director Clara Lindley Meyer. <laughs> Department of Conservation Director Sarah Parker Pauley. Department of Corrections Director Ann Presythe. <laughs> Acting Director of Department of Economic Development Maggie Coast. <laughs> Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Commissioner Dr. Margie Van Dieven. <laughs> Department of Education and Workforce Development Commissioner Zora Mulligan. Department of Health and Senior Services Director Donald Karloff. <laughs> Department of Labor and Industrial Relations Director Anna Hugh. <laughs> Department of Mental Health Director Valerie Hewn. <laughs> Department of Natural Resources Director Drew Button. <laughs> Department of Public Safety Director Sandy Carson. Department of Revenue Director, Wayne Wallingford. <laughs> Few people know Wayne Wallingford. <laughs> Department of Social Services Acting Director, Robert Nodell. <laughs> Department of Transportation Director, Patrick McKenna. Missouri Health Net Director, Todd Richardson. Missouri State Fire Marshal, Tim Bean. Missouri National Guard Adjutant General, Major General LaVon Compton. Missouri Highway Patrol Superintendent, Colonel Eric Olson. Missouri State Emergency Management Director, Jim Remillard. <laughs> Missouri Veterans Commission Executive Director, Paul Kirkhoff. <laughs> and Missouri Budget Director, Dan Hogg. <laughs> I'm also pleased to introduce this afternoon to my left, the incredibly gracious and inspiring First Lady, Teresa Parson. And please help me welcome my wife, Claudia Kehoe. Mr. Sergeant of Arms. Mr. President, the Governor of the State of Missouri now approaches the chamber. Mr. Sergeant of Arms, open the doors to allow the governor to enter. The escort committee will escort the governor to the dais.
Let's welcome the escort committee and the governor. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the 57th governor of the great state of Missouri, Governor Mike Parson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Speaker, statewide officials, judges of the Missouri Supreme Court, and the state legislators. It is an honor to stand before you today as the 57th governor of the great state of Missouri. Once again, we're at an exciting time for Missouri. In our future, this past year, we will celebrate the bicentennial of our state and 150 years of the Missouri Governor's Mansion. I was honored to have served as Missouri's governor during this remarkable milestone of our state. The First Lady and I were fortunate to be able to tour Missouri and visit communities all across the state and witness their individual contributions to our rich history. From the U.S., from Ulysses S. Grant National Historical Site in St. Louis, to the Hubble Space Telescope in Marshfield, from Walt Disney and Marceline, to Jesse James' birthplace in Kearney, from John J. Pershing in Laclede, to Mark Twain in Hannibal, and 
How could we ever forget Maxie the Goose in small town Sumner, Missouri? After more than 45 bicentennial stops, the First Lady and I count ourselves blessed to have experienced the history, tradition, and heart and soul of what makes Missouri great. Faith, family, neighbors helping neighbors, that's who Missourians are. And that's what makes Missouri the best state in the United States. We were also able to host the Bicentennial Parade and the inaugural ball that was enjoyed and celebrated by Missourians from all over the state. Our historic parade included over 100 entries and proudly showcased communities all across Missouri, including the Lincoln University Marching Musical Storm, the Budweiser Clydesdales, Chinese Dragon Dancers, and the Negro League Baseball Museum. It marked the first time in our state's history the inaugural ball was held outside. And we counted ourselves fortunate to be able to celebrate with thousands of Missourians, many of them which had never experienced the inaugural ball. But none of this would have been possible without the efforts state government undertook to lessen the impacts of COVID-19. When I stood before you last year, our limited supply of COVID-19 vaccines were available for only a small group of Missourians. No one had a roadmap or a playbook, and we knew we faced difficult times ahead. Nevertheless, state government accepted the challenge and prevailed by focusing on fairness in our vaccine distribution efforts. While there will always be endless critics to tell us how we could have done it better, the facts are we were the ones in the arena. We made the tough decisions and never cowered down to the challenges we faced. Today, one of our greatest successes is the fact that more than 94% of Missourians 65 and older, our most vulnerable population, have received protection from the virus. And nearly 75% of Missourians 18 and older have received a vaccine. Now, while we have room to improve, encourage all Missourians to consider vaccine. We have worked tirelessly to ensure that vaccines are available to every Missourian that wants one. And we couldn't have done it without the dedicated public servants at the Department of Health and Senior Services, the State Emergency Management Agency, the Missouri National Guard, the Department of Public Safety, doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals, and the thousands of local partners for their bold and heroic actions throughout the pandemic. Joining us today are individuals who we would like to give a special thanks to. Michael McMillan and James Clark with the Urban League in St. Louis, and Pastor Miles and his wife, and Janet Miles Barty with the Morning Star Baptist Church in Kansas City were instrumental and helping vaccinate some of our most vulnerable populations. With these trusted leaders aiding our efforts, we were able to get hundreds of thousands in Kansas City and St. Louis vaccinated. Additionally, seated in the upper chamber is Colonel Russell Cole with the Missouri National Guard. He helped lead our state vaccine operations. Colonel Cole, and our Missouri National Guard members worked around the clock to get vaccines to Missourians as quickly as possible. Our Missouri National Guard members answered the call and completed the mission. Would Michael, James, Pastor Miles, Janet, Colonel Cole, please be stand and be recognized.
Missouri is a diverse state, and a one-size-fits-all approach will never work here. In this state, we use common sense and took a balanced approach to the pandemic. And while that may not seem like a novel idea, when you look to some of the policies and mandates in other states and places, you find that common sense may not be so common. We never had any state mandates or forced businesses, schools, or churches to close in this state. We protected lives and livelihoods in this state. And when it comes to COVID-19 mandates, I firmly believe that the people should have a say through their local elected representatives and not be dictated by needless executive action or any one person. That's why I don't support and have never supported mandates and Missourians can rest assured that my position will not change. Today, our economy has nearly fully recovered, and we have the opportunity to make fundamental improvements to our state that will serve Missourians now and into the future. Missouri is strong today and will be even stronger tomorrow. <laughs> Missouri has a solid foundation, and that is something we should all be proud of. Republicans, Democrats, independents, rural, suburban, and urban. It is a foundation that has helped propel our state to new heights in just a few short years and has set us on a course to achieve even greater accomplishments. Unfortunately, it seems success can be purposely overshadowed because positive news don't sell headlines. But rest assured, we refuse to discount the good things happening in Missouri. Whether you live in the Boot Hill, the Ozarks, St. Louis, Kansas City, or anywhere across the state, our relentless focus on workforce development and infrastructure is paying dividends for all Missourians. Our unemployment rate sits at 3.5%. That's below where we were before the pandemic and below the national average. And when we had an all-time high of 385,000 individuals on unemployment. We knew we had to take action and solve this problem. Missouri was one of the first in the nation to cut off the federal unemployment benefits, and today only 21,000 are drawing benefits. This was the right call and the right thing to do. We are finding economic success, but with 116,000 job openings across the state, now more than ever, it is important to double down on workforce development and skill up our workers to fill these open jobs. We can't be satisfied with the same as before. We must focus on making our state even stronger. Even during the pandemic, we created more than 21,000 new jobs. We saw nearly $5.2 billion in private investment. In 2021, we saw new businesses and existing businesses expand their footprint here in Missouri, including Deli Star, with nearly $100 million invested, 475 new jobs in St. Louis. Gateway Studios, with $111 million invested and more than 100 new jobs in Chesterfield. MEMC, a semiconductor manufacturing company, invested $210 million and 75 new jobs created in O'Fallon. 
and John Deere Rehman with $11 million and 130 new jobs created in Springfield. But business investments didn't just occur near Missouri's urban centers. We saw Carlisle Construction Materials invest $62 million and create 100 new jobs in Sykeston, Missouri. Swift Prepared Foods invested $250 million and created nearly 400 new jobs in Moberly and Columbia. American Food Group plans to invest $450 million and create 1,300 new jobs in Warren County. Amazon created 400 new jobs in Republic. Frozen Food Express invested $6 million and created 60 new jobs in Butler. Coffee Tree Group created 50 new jobs in Marceline, a town of just 2,000 people. And we could go on and on. But the point is, our small towns, big cities, or anywhere in between, Missouri is open for business, and business is good. And the rest of the nation is taking notice. And companies are looking to our state for their future business expansions. And while we're at it, I want all of you to hear some of the amazing recognitions and rankings our state has earned because we all work together. We are now first in the United States for on-the-job training. We are third in the United States for apprenticeships. We are third in the United States for our business tax index, far outranking all of our neighboring states. We are fourth in the United States for new manufacturing facilities. We are fourth in the United States for best places to retire. We are fifth in the United States for our low cost of doing business. We are seventh in the United States for people relocating to our state. And we are seventh in the United States for tech manufacturing growth. Now, believe it or not, I'm only halfway through. We are eighth in the United States for economic recovery. We are eighth in the United States for best place to work for nurses. We are ninth in the United States for military retirees. We are ninth in the United States for housing affordability. And we are 10th in the United States for automobile and aerospace industries. We are 10th in the United States for new business expansions. And we are 10th in the United States for site selections. And ladies, listen to this next one. This one. We are 10th in the United States for women in technology here in Missouri. Later this evening, we will share these rankings with each of you. And I hope you promote these wins for every district, every county, and every Missouri. The bottom line is Missouri's economy is strong. <laughs> With a historic budget surplus and federal dollars coming into our state, we want to build on our past momentum to capture even greater opportunities for the future of Missourians. But I want to remind you that our economy is strong despite federal funding. When other states will be using federal dollars to fill spending gaps and budget shortfalls, we will be making investments in the future because in Missouri, we took a common sense approach to the pandemic, never shut our businesses down, and have always had a conservative and balanced budget. By doing so, you'll also be happy to hear that thanks to our record economic performance, Missourians will receive an additional tax cut this year.
The tax rate will be reduced to a new low of 5.3%, easing Missourians' tax burdens yet again. Thanks to common sense, responsible spending, and working with the General Assembly. With this, this will be the second time our administration has cut taxes for Missourians. <laughs> However, we must work to maintain this strong economy position by establishing a cash operating expense fund, by setting aside an additional 2.5% of general revenue, we will achieve financial stability when the rainy days do come. This is the responsible thing to do. This is the conservative thing to do. This is the right thing to do. From the beginning, we challenged the legislature to support workforce development infrastructure, strengthen our communities, and improve government. And we have achieved some historic wins in each of those areas together. This session, we must recommit ourselves to helping skill up our workforce and preparing the next generations for the demands of the future. Over the last few years, it has become more important than ever to provide adults with opportunities to learn new skills and develop their career potentials. In just a short time, and despite the pandemic, our fast track program saw a 65% increase in participants in 2021. To our surprise, 80% of the recipients are women and 50% are first-generation college students. Additionally, more than 50% are enrolled in health care programs, which has become a blessing considering the last 22 months. We are happy to have two outstanding fast-track participants from Bolivar Technical College with us here today. Shanisha Alexander and Brian Webb are pursuing degrees in nursing. And we are proud of these students for their commitment and working toward a better future for themselves and their families. Would Ms. Alexander and Mr. Webb please stand to be recognized. As you can see, this program is making a real difference for many Missourians, and that's why we must permanently establish this program. In 2019, we also revamped Missouri One Start through the Talent for Tomorrow initiative, and today that program is ranked ninth in the United States. In three years, in three years, Missouri One Start assisted companies locating or expanding in Missouri with more than 700 programs aimed at recruiting and training new employees. More than 76,000 workers have received training through this successful program. To continue this path, we must have a talented and dedicated team across state government. I know that many of you would agree the Missouri has some of the best of the best in our ranks. The success of our state relies heavily on these public servants. And we must ensure we are able to recruit and retain quality team members to serve Missouri. And that's why we are proposing an immediate 5.5% cost of living adjustment for all state employees. This is long overdue.
Another group of dedicated state team members is my cabinet. Our administration wouldn't have success without these individuals leading our state workforce, leading 16 departments and 42,000 individuals is no small task. But we couldn't be more proud of the work they do every day. Would the members of my cabinet please stand to be recognized for the incredible things you have done for the citizens of the great state of Missouri. The future of Missouri and Missouri families relies upon children being healthy, safe, and ready to learn. We must continue to invest in our children and their education. My own daughter is a public school teacher, and I know the tough jobs our education, educators take on. But they answer the call and work hard every day to prepare the next generations of Missourians. Our students deserve a quality education, and their parents demand it. And that's why we are, again, fully funding the foundation formula. Our teachers, administrators, and staff work tirelessly to support Missouri students. Last year, 95% of Missouri schools saw the value of in-person learning and did the right thing by keeping their doors open and our kids in schools where they belong. And, and thanks to their efforts, Missouri ranked fifth in the United States for the highest proportion of in-person learning during the 2021 school year. <laughs> Nothing can replace the classroom, and we are proud of those who recognize this and thank them for their dedication to Missouri children. Unfortunately, Missouri is currently ranked 50th in the United States for starting teacher pay, and half of our new teachers leave the profession by their fifth year. This is unacceptable, and we must do better. That's why we are proposing to raise teacher pay in every corner of this state by part <laughs> by partnering with local school districts. We can increase the baseline salary of new teachers to $38,000 and take the first step in addressing this issue. I want to take a moment to highlight one of our exceptional educators here in Missouri. Ms. Beth Huff is the principal of Fulton Middle School and has recently been named the National Principal of the Year by the National Association of Secondary School Principals. This marks the first time in our state's history that a Missouri principal has earned this top recognition. We know the vast majority of Missouri educators get it right day in and day out. And Mrs. Huff is a shining example of someone who gets it right. Mrs. Huff, would you please stand and be recognized? No one in this chamber would be here today without quality educators in their lives, myself included. In the current labor shortage, 
We must make lasting investments in our state's continuing education programs to prepare the next generations, the jobs of the future. That's why we are requesting $31 million for our college and universities through Missouri Excel's projects. This will help expand enrollment in high demand jobs. Additionally, we are investing $20 million in grant funding for our 57 area career centers to expand career and technical education programs. With us here today are students in career and technical education programs that represent schools and communities across the state that will benefit from these investments. From the Northland Career Center Law Enforcement Training Academy, we have Major Audrey Strope and Sergeant Nate Wasson. From Cape Girardeau Career and Technical Center, we have Nicholas Hodges, Computer Networking and Security. Lada Strickland from Graphic Design and Anwin Sewer for Digital Media. From Carthage Technical Center Health Science, we have Olivia Bogolet, Danny Darlin, Carla Simpson. From Jefferson City Nichols Career Center, we have Cody Elliott, a second year welding student. From Pike Lincoln Technical Center, we have Destiny Gable, Building Trades and Construction. Haley Dow, Automobile Collision. Joe Mound, Diesel Technology. It's programs like these that offer a path for students to pursue high demand, good paying jobs, and we must continue to support them in this st state. Please join me in recognizing these hardworking students. After working closely with Missouri's higher education institution, we are very proud to be able to increase our investments in higher education. We will recommend funding for the top capital improvements at state community colleges and four-year institution. Combined with the Missouri Excels projects and scholarship opportunities, this investment will total nearly 600 million dollars and generate over 1.1 billion dollars in economic impact for our state. As I've often said, workforce development and infrastructure go hand in hand. For our state to be successful, we must invest in both. Communities across the state are faced with costly public water and wastewater systems repair and replacement. In order for individuals to live, work, and raise a family, the maintenance and improvements of these public systems must be a priority. The state and local governments must work together to make meaningful and lasting investments that will strengthen every town and county in this state. Under our proposal, we will make $250 million available to communities across the state to enhance access to safe drinking water and responsible wastewater, and $150 million to enhance stormwater systems. While I do not agree with the massive expansion of the federal debt, the responsibility falls on us to invest wisely and make smart decisions. We must do what the federal government cannot. Speaking of strengthening our communities, we are as incredibly proud of the progress that has been made thanks to Focus on Bridges. This program set out to repair and replace 250 bridges across the state. We are now nearing completion of 75% of these bridges. 
And this program's success has allowed us to leverage hundreds of millions of dollars in additional infrastructure investments in every region of this state. It is critical that we continue making these important investments. That's why we are proposing $75 million to continue our transportation cost share program for road and bridge projects that bring economic impact to our state. And $100 million to improve low volume roads and minor routes across the state of Missouri. These are the hardest routes to fund and are important to local communities, especially in rural Missouri. This investment will help us free up additional funding for much needed projects in suburban and urban areas, leaving no region behind. This year, we are also proposing $400 million to further increase broadband, the largest single investment in our state's history. <laughs> this investment will increase access across Missouri for rural areas, but also urban areas that are underserved. With this plan, we will connect 75,000 households with high-speed broadband and invest $30 million toward constructing and upgrading cell towers to expand wireless networks across the state. This is another core investment we are making for the next generations and the future of our state. Road and bridge repair, broadband expansion, are not only important for every Missourian, but are critical for the state's number one industry, agriculture. For Missouri agriculture to remain strong, we must prioritize the extension of critical agriculture tax credits that support Missouri farmers and ranchers, ag businesses, and value-added products. Be because we must always stand with Missourians, diverse group, of agriculture producers. These men and women wake up every day to feed and fuel the world. And this has been especially true over the past 22 months. When we were facing tough food supply chain issues, they adjusted, they adapted, and they put food on the table, allowing us to avoid the hardships experienced in other states that's why we're calling for $10 million to expand agriculture innovation and workforce programs. Investments like this help ensure the agriculture way of life in the state of Missouri can be passed down to the next generations. And speaking of the next generations, seated in the upper gallery, we have members of the Paris, Missouri FFA chapter which was recently recognized as the 2021 National FFA Chapter of the Year, the highest award a chapter can earn in the nation. Out of nearly 9,000 chapters nationwide, we are proud to be home of the National FFA Chapter of the Year and even prouder of these Paris, Missouri students. Would the members of the Paris FFA please stand to be recognized? With nearly $94 billion in economic impact and nearly 460,000 jobs, 
Missouri is an agriculture state, and we must never forget it. And as a third generation farmer, you can rest assured that agriculture will always remain a top priority of this administration. Another area of focus this year is on creating more opportunities for our communities. To further our goal to use public resources to make meaningful long-term investments across the state. We will set aside $250 million for a statewide revitalization grant program to spur local economic development. This program will help bring economic opportunity communities across the state train more workers, define competitive advantage, and bring more jobs to Missouri. Another asset for communities all across the state is our state park and conservation network that is enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of visitors each year. More and more people are getting out and experiencing Missouri's great outdoors, and this year, we have the opportunity to solidify this state asset and economic driver and expand tourism. By investing $69 million to start the construction of the Rock Island Trail, we can establish the largest circular rail to trail network in the United States and a world class, one of a kind destination for travelers coming to Missouri while also supporting and creating jobs in this state. One of the lessons we learn from COVID-19 pandemic is that we must also support communities by strengthening our healthcare networks across the state. That's why are we asking for a $34 million investment in rural communities to increase access to telehealth and telemedicine services. And another historic investment we're recommending is a new multi-agency state health laboratory. This lab will accommodate the needs of the Department of Health and Senior Services, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Conservation, and the Department of Natural Resources and join them together on one campus. This will lead to safer, healthier Missourians and a more efficient use of public resources. This year, we are also proposing to double the capacity of our Missouri Autism Centers. This will help more families navigate the challenges of treating autism and reduce the backlog for Missouri's families desperately needing service. I want to thank State Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick and the First Lady for helping bring this to our attention and working to get this done. This year, we must take a renewed look at public safety and how best to fight violent crime. We must continue to support our law enforcement professionals who put their lives on the line to protect our families. We can do this by ensuring consistent requirements and appropriate penalties to hold violent criminals accountable while also protecting Missouri's Second Amendment rights just as our administration has always done. That said, it's just not how we deal with violent criminals. We must make sure those with behavioral health and substance use disorders receive the treatment and support they need. Last year, with the support of the General Assembly, 
we made great progress in providing proper treatment to oppositions to Missouri's, Missourians by increasing community support through crisis stabilization centers and community behavioral health liaisons. And this year, we're asking to provide an additional $140 million to support and increase services at health centers across this state. Last year, we also highlighted the first law enforcement training academy in the country at a historically black college at Lincoln University. And this year, we're building on that investment with over $11 million for upgrades and to provide more scholarships for law enforcement officers to receive post-certification and put more officers on the streets. Thanks to the leadership of Senator Williams, Senator Luke DeMeyer, and Representative Roberts, we can ensure our law enforcement professionals are using policing strategies and techniques that make us all proud. With us here today is a very special guest, Missouri State Highway Patrolman, Trooper Colton J. Beck. In December, Trooper Beck was attempting to conduct a routine traffic stop when the suspect fled and a pursuit ensued. The suspect then opened fire on Trooper Beck, striking him in the face, the neck, and the upper torso. Despite being seriously injured, Trooper Beck remained calm and assisted his fellow officers despite the threat posed to his life. He is a proud example of all our law enforcement officers who serve this state honorably. Would you please join me in giving Trooper Beck a well-deserved round of applause. Missourians respect law and order, but as a former sheriff, it alarms me to see some of the attitudes towards those who have taken an oath to defend our communities and keep us safe. We must work to strengthen our communities by supporting our men and women in law enforcement and learn from the failed policies in other cities and states to never allow anti-law enforcement measures to take hold in this state. In Missouri, we defend law enforcement, not defund them. During my first State of the State, I laid out our strategy to focus on workforce development and infrastructure. Now we have a real opportunity to make lasting investments in these areas and the future of our state. But with these responsibilities, be mindful. With these responsibilities, be mindful about the role of government and where and how it should be involved. Government should invest, not waste. Government should lead, not dictate. 
and government should support, not mandate, and we must all remember that. In this state, we have created tens of thousands of new jobs, but we can do more. We have built hundreds of new bridges and repaired thousands of miles of roads, but we can do more. We have expanded broadband to thousands of homes and businesses, but we can do more. We have strengthened communities in urban areas, in suburban areas, in rural areas, but we can do more. And we are ready to stand with each and every one of you to do more for the people of this great state. It is our time, and the time is now. In closing, there's a story from this past year that I want to share with all of you. In September... I stood on the tarmac at Lambert Airport when a young man made his return home and when a family found the courage to welcome him one last time. Corporal Jared Schmidt made the ultimate sacrifice for his bravery in defending this nation during the withdrawal from Afghanistan. He did his duty with honor, without question, to protect freedom for his family, his community, his state, and his nation. And in such a difficult moment, one wonders, how can we ever make it through? But by taking a look around, you can always find the answer. It's our people. When our nation couldn't be more divided, I saw a community that couldn't be more closer. When a family felt the pain and loss, I saw them embraced by friends, neighbors, and total strangers. In this challenging moment, I saw the best of who Missourians are. That's why I'm proud to be the governor of this great state. And as we close out these past 22 months and look to our next chapter, remember, our strength is our people. When times are hard, Missourians move forward. When someone is down, Missourians lift them up. These past years have been tough and dividing for a lot of people. But Missourians stay true. They give their best. And they always put others first. And we are a better state, a better people because of it. When we look to the future and not dwell in the past, when we find solutions instead of problems, when we stand together instead of apart, we can accomplish anything. We must always keep pushing forward in this state. But no one, no one is coming to do it for us. Missouri is strong today and will be even stronger tomorrow. It is an honor and privilege to be the governor of the great state of Missouri. God bless you. God bless Missouri. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you.
Will the escort committee please escort the governor from the chamber? Chair recognizes the senator from Boone County. Senator from Boone moves that the joint session be dissolved. All those in favor, vote by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The joint session shall stand dissolved. Gentlemen from St. Louis County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next order of business is announcements. Announcements. Gentlemen from Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, your committee on downsizing state government will uh, convene again after this dismissal. Further announcements.
Gentleman from Livingston. Mr. Speaker, your Committee on Education Appropriations will meet tomorrow at 8 a.m. in Hearing Room 3. Thank you, sir. Further announcements? Seeing none, gentleman from St. Louis County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With no business before the body today, I now move that the House stand adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, January the 20th, 2022. The gentleman from St. Louis County moved that the House stand adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, January 20th, 2022. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The House is adjourned.